Um, so I'm a bit of an odd one out at this conference. I'm not a vaccines researcher. Um, so what I'm going to be telling you about today is some more general lessons that we found from behavioural science and influencing government policy, and particularly how you can get some of these more behavioural approaches into people who might not be familiar with them. And then I'm going to give you an example from a totally different context, from organ donation, that highlights lots of these, and we'll see how much you will know about behavioural science. Okay, sound good? Well, that's all the slides I've got, so we're going to have to do it. Okay, we... Or maybe we won't have to do it. If this... Right, click is dead. So, uh, who's heard of behavioural insights before? For the mo most part, great. So, this... Uh, really started off with this book called Nudge. Uh, so this was Richard, uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. And last year, many of you would have Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And so it's kind of grown in popularity. Um, but I'm, I'm from a team called Behavioral Insights Team. And we sometimes got called the Nudge Unit, though that's not technically what we do. Um, and we started life inside the UK government. So we started off between Number 10 and the Cabinet Office, which is sort of central offices of government in the UK. And we were tasked with using findings from behavioural science, so broadly psychology and economics for the most part, to influence government policy across all different policy areas. So we were given two years to come up with ten times our cost savings back or we get shut down. And luckily we managed to do that and the team's kind of grown since then. So although we're still part owned by the UK government, the Cabinet Office, we're now no longer officially part of it, so we're not civil servants, which has meant we've been able to do work with lots of areas that might not be central government priorities at a given time, and also outside of the UK. So we now have offices all over the world. Uh, we've got about 170 people. Well, this is older slide. It's actually about 200 now. We've run about 500 trials. So for the most part, these trials are randomised control trials. Um, varying, and this varies from sort of quite simple messaging trials, you know, trying out different A-B testing on websites, all the way to sort of big field trials, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people, multiple sites across the UK. And... So there are three important points for or what, I, what I would say to a behavioral insights approach. There is where you get the ideas from. So it's all we can have lots of clever ideas. We can steal them from all the academics like yourselves, from psychology and economics. And that, that's great, and that's really important. But they won't go anywhere unless you know how to get them implemented <coughs> in practice. So we were part of the cabinet office, so I, I used to be a civil servant. And so you sort of know how government works. You know how local authorities work. You know how the NHS works. You have these people who are familiar with doing things in these contexts. So you can take your interesting idea and actually implement it in the field. And then once you've had a clever idea and you've actually made it happen, did it actually work? Right? A lot of the things that we would hope work, that you might think from a lab study would work, you might, you know, it just might be a good idea that you've got might not have the impact that you think it has, or it might have some unintended consequences. So these are sort of the three core parts of this behavioral, behavioral insights approach. And just a very recap for those of you who might not be as familiar with it, one of the core ideas is this dual system way of thinking, so that people operate under either system one or system two. Now, obviously, it's a continuum, right? but it's kind of helped to have this dichotomy. So system two is really how we would like to think we think about most things. You know, when you're genuinely engaging with an issue, when you're being deliberate, analytical about something, and it's your reflective state. This is kind of you, you at, your, at your best. And then there's a system one, which is much more intuitive. It's you based on habit. It's more automatic. And the thing is, you actually spend the vast majority of your time making up decisions in this life. Right? So the chances are that anybody who's actually making a decision about vaccines or, or anything, thinking about in anything like the level of detail that you do, your colleagues do, or people in the, who sort of work in your area do, is so small. I've got a hundred other things to be thinking about at any given time, and so it's, it's more likely they're going to be operating under this sort of system. Um, what f I'll just take one of the examples. So taking your daily commute. You can probably do that without really thinking about what you're doing. You know, you can be on your phone, you can be texting people. You don't have to be paying a lot of attention. But you can't do it with your eyes closed. Right? It's not completely ingrained in you. You're taking cues from your environment, and you're using those to make decisions very, very quickly with a very high fl uh, processing fluency. And so then it follows on if we're operating under this system a lot of the time, and that this system is really, you take cues from your environment, 
then it might be that environmental effects have a lot more strength in terms of behavior change than people might have previously considered. So rather than necessarily focusing on people's perceived motivation or something, you know, what they, what they tell you is likely to affect the behavior, how can we make it easier for people to do things by changing the environment they find themselves in. And just to be clear about this, environment is used in a broad sense here, so not just physical environment, but social environment, informational environment, financial environment. And I'm a psychologist by, by training, and so this is the example I like to give. Right, which one of these squares is darker? They're the same. Also playing with the animations. Um, so if context affects something as simple as how dark or light a gray square is, Surely it has important connotations for how people make more complex decisions. And so when you're doing any of this work, it's really important to go out and experience the context in which people find themselves in. And that potentially poses difficulties for public policy, particularly when, you know, if, if any of you have been to Westminster, it doesn't look like most of the UK. Right? M most of the places where central government policy is made is quite different from the places that you're really trying to, trying to access. And so it's important that you, you don't think one is representative of the other. So we've done lots and lots of work with civil servants or governments over the years. And we've developed this, this framework to try to make it easy for people to understand some of the core principles of behavioral science. So this is by no means an overarching framework. This is a deliberate oversimplification of the field. So this, uh, this stands for EAST. Make things easy, attractive, social, and timely. And I'm going to really quickly cover a couple of the examples by what that means, and then I'll go into one overarching example of that. So first of all, make things easy. What does this mean? Well, this can be defaults that we've heard about before. You know, can you actually fully default somebody into something, or do you have these softer defaults where something might be pre-checked as a choice, but it's not really forcing you to do it? The importance of defaults center around inertia if people just don't get round to doing it. And it might be particularly effective for something that people are broadly in line with. You know, they broadly say, I, I agree with this, but maybe I just don't get round to doing it. An example from a different field would be pension savings in the UK. So you're now defaulted into uh, saving for a pension. You can opt out of it. And if you have a strong preference, it doesn't stop you. It's not sort of binding in any way. But for all of those people who, you know, probably do want to do it but haven't got round to it, it pushes them in that direction. This can be simplifying the information that you give to people. So this can be cutting down the amount of text you give. As you'll see from lots of government communications, they're often quite lengthy things. And people don't have a lot of time to read things. A, a, an example I give people, if you flip over a letter, if you give people three seconds to read it, that's probably a good proxy for how much time they'll actually spend reading it. So if you can't get the core message in that sort of time, you're not onto a winner. This can also be reducing friction costs in a process. So this, this can be making things less difficult for people. You can imagine having fewer clicks through a website, you know, having fewer stages in a process. And you know, in, in, this in this context, it can also be making things more difficult. Right? You, could have, you could be reducing friction costs, having sort of a predefined appointment for somebody so they don't have to book it themselves for the flu shots at a workplace, for example. Or you could be trying to increase the difficulty of trying to go for exemptions from vaccines. So you could have, there's some data from the US that shows sort of different states and the different uh, levels of how difficult it is to apply for an exemption seem to correlate with how many people actually end up doing it. So even these things that people say they might have a strong ideological position in, if you put a bit of friction, make things easier or, le or less easy, it can change actual behavior. Next, making things attractive. So this can be just deliberately attracting attention, how big, bold, bright something is, how loud you're, loud you're saying it. This can be personalizing things. So how many people are familiar with the cocktail party effect? This idea that if you hear your name in a crowded room, you attend to it very quickly. Or you're very used to responding to your name. So even things, you might have seen a proliferation of you getting emails addressed to you by your first name in the last five years. Yeah, so that there is good academic evidence that, that does tend to work. Uh, but then there's also personalizing the content of the information. So not just saying, hey, Hugo but saying, hey, Hugo, there's this thing about behavioral science. You might be interested in it. Like, yes, I would be interested in that. I'm always interested in behavioral science. But somebody else, might, you might want to say, this is interesting finding from economics, interesting finding from psychology. Right? It can be the same real content, but you're just changing the framing of it, changing it to personalize what might be interesting to the individual. And this can also talk about incentives or rewards. So not just the presence of an incentive or reward, but how you frame that to people. So when you're thinking of, 
things as gain or loss framing, or even if you're thinking about the expected value of something. So the idea that would you prefer 100% chance of 10 pounds, or one in 10 chance of 100 pounds, one in 100 chance of 1,000 pounds. All of these things have the same expected value. They'll cost the same on average to government. I imagine you will kind of respond to them a little bit differently, though. Your, your gut reaction to them feels a little different. And different things of these will work better in different circumstances. Next, about making things social. So humans are inherently social beings. We care about what people around us are doing, and particularly the group that we identify with, so our in-group. So we care about the overall majority and not being in the minority of the people that we care about. And so this leads to descriptive social norms being effective as interventions in many conditions. So this idea, we've had a lot of success with this in the past, if 9 out of 10 people do X, 9 out of 10 people pay their tax on time. This empirically increases the number of people who end up paying their tax. And can you use things like this to show that m most people are doing this? And, you know, whilst not sort of completely ignoring potential issues of free rider effects or things like that. Can you use network nudges? So this idea that information is transferred through networks with central nodes in them. Can you use this to propagate your information in a more effective way than you would have been able to otherwise? So an example for this would be in educational anti-bullying. They asked the kids who all the most popular kids were, and they took those kids and put them on a training course. They compared that with asking the teachers who the most popular kids were. Guess which one worked best? Right? So can you actually use information from a social network to work out who are the most important people that you need to contact? And you can also look at commitments or reciprocity. So the idea that if you commit to something in a public forum, if you commit to something in front of people that you care about, you might be more likely to do it. Interesting thing about this is you probably don't want it to be too close. So if you say to your spouse, for example, you have to make sure I go to the gym. You have, every day, if I say I'm too tired, you have to make sure that I do it. Well, they don't want the hassle of you snapping back at them. Right? Work colleague, maybe more so. Like, hey, Hughes, you didn't go to the gym today. What are you playing at? You know, but, so you need to get these balances right. It's not always the sort of closer the better for these sorts of things. And lastly, making it timely. So this can be prompts or reminders at different time points. You know, these, these are generally very effective. Often it's not that people have decided that they don't want to do something or decided it's not important. It's just not front of mind. And that goes back to the system one. Is there a cue in your environment that's reminding you to do this thing? This can be planning. So you've probably, you're probably all aware of the old Katie Milkman paper on getting people to uh, attend vaccine appointments. It's more effective if you get plan people to plan not just the date of it, but also the time of it. So as more specific a plan can be, the more likely you are to go through with it. And you can also think about how people perceive time and the relative value of it. So this idea that you discount rewards in the future. And if we're thinking about you know, other potential pros to vaccines, you know, do you think that will happen later? You, know, you might get flu in a couple of months' time versus you, know, you might have the pain of getting a needle in your arm right now. Well, people might not think about those things in a strictly rational way. You might have to try to bring the rewards more salient into the present. So those are examples of sort of general points that we like to consider and things that we found have worked quite well when talking to government officials or people who don't have a background in behavioral science, psychology, economics, give people sort of rules of thumb that you can use as sort of a, sort of a checklist. And there's a, there's a publication that you can look up online. If you just Google East Framework, then this, you can sort of, it's freely available to everyone. It's been, been downloaded about 60,000 times at the moment. So I'm going to give you an example from a totally different area that ticks off a lot of these boxes. So I'm going to talk to you about this example from organ donation. So I think there are some similarities between vaccines and organ donation. So this is, this is registering for the organ uh, donor register. That means that your organs can be used to donate to someone after you die. Right? So this isn't giving somebody a kidney when you're alive. This is after you've passed away. And you only need to register once. It's a one-off behavior that you need people to do. And if, if you've done that, then that sort of carries on. And it's something that the vast majority of people in the UK say they're in favor of. So all the sort of survey evidence that you get says that about 90% nine, nine of people are readily in favor of it, but they tend not to get around to doing it. And there's also a similarity in that there's a minority vocal opposition. Right? There, are, there are small groups within the UK who really don't like organ donation. So what the UK government did they were asking, well, how can we get people to, how can we get people to register an organ 
organ donor. Well, what current touch points do we have? And one of the current touch points that they have is when people need to go online to renew a tax disc. So how can you make it easy for people? If people are already doing something, can you bring the service to them? So this is an online registration page. It gets a huge number of hits every year. If lots of people in the UK have cars. You need to renew this every year. But it's not something you would immediately associate with organ donation. right? You didn't come here for this. It's you sort of tacking this message on to something that people need to do anyway as part of their daily life. So once people have completed this car tax renewal, then a pop-up comes up. And we tried eight different variants. So this is done as a fully randomized control trial. I think there's an A, B, C, D, E, F, G type test. Because we weren't sure what is the most motivating method, me message, sorry, the most motivating message at this point to get people to register. Make sense for everyone? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read out the different uh, versions. Then I'm gonna get you all to put your hands up to vote for which one you think is gonna be, work the best, and then I'll give you the results. Does that make sense for everybody? Excellent. So, the first condition is a simple control condition. It just says, please join the, oh. It just says, please join the NHS organ donor register. And there's no additional text. Does that for everybody? The next one says, every day, thousands of people who see this page decide to register. So this can be thought of as sort of an active social norms condition. You don't have the majority going through, but this idea that thousands of people are doing, are doing something, well, it must be a good thing. Maybe I should do it too. Next, we have the exact same message. Every day, thousands of people who see this page decide to register with the additional group photo. So this is a congruent image that uh, the idea is that it backs up the messaging behind the text. Next, exact same text again, but with what was the official logo at the time. So, you know, do people sort of take it more seriously if it's a logo that they might recognize? Next, three people die every day because there are not enough organ donors. This can be thought of as sort of a loss frame or more, more negatively framing things. Crucially, this is true. Right? You're not allowed to make anything up with these sorts of messages. And this is, uh, so this is, this is, in the UK, this is true. Or you could save or transform up to nine lives as an organ donor. Again, much more positive. Right? Maybe this works better for some people. And again, importantly, true. If you need an organ transplant, would you have one? If so, please help others. So idea of reciprocity or fairness. And if you support organ donation, please turn your support into action. This idea that we know the majority of people say they support this, so can you get at that gap between their intentions and their actions? You know, do, they, do they feel a little bit of un uncomfortable if they realize that their actions aren't in line with what their stated beliefs are? So these are the eight different versions. We're going to do hands up, and I will laser point at you if you don't vote. So <laughs> hands up uh, for, each, for one, the ones you think works the best. You can only vote once. So hands up for the control. One, good, for someone who got the control. Hands up for the social norm condition, so this was without any image. No one? Hands up for the social norm condition with a picture. Ma majority? Hands up for the social norm with a logo? Smattering? Three people die every day. A couple of pessimists. So you could save or transform up to nine lives. More positive. Uh, reciprocity, if you need one, would you have one? Smattering again. And if you support organ donation. So. I get people to vote for a couple of reasons. One, to stop hindsight bias. So you can't say, oh, well, I knew that all along, because now I've got a visual record of who voted for who. And two, to show there's a distinction of opinion within the room, right? You didn't all vote for one of them. But all of these got at least one vote. And there's, there's justification that any of these could have been the most effective, right? We shouldn't be trialing things that we think are straw men, you know, things that we don't think will work, okay? So here are the results. So in the control condition, 2.3% of people who that pop-up came up for both clicked the link and then fully completed the registration form. So we looked at you know, the, the end behavior that we're looking for here. So that's with no, no additional messaging. If you add the turn your support into action, this goes up a little bit to 2.8%. The social norm performs a little bit better, but not much, up to 2.9%, so that's just the text on its own. Adding the heart does absolutely nothing. It doesn't improve it in any way. Save or transform up to nine lives, more positive. That was the second most popular in the room. Again, no better. Three people die every day. This is a small improvement, sort of harsher. So idea of reciprocity, 3.2%. So again, a little bit better. And you know, if you needed an organ transplant, would you have one? The, but the norm and the picture message, the one that worked the best, uh, the one that uh, you all thought would work the best, was the worst. <laughs> 
So it was worse than it was worse than any of them, and this was a this was a surprise, right? It's, hopefully, it's a surprise to you. I've done I've got people to do this over a hundred times. It's really normally the one that comes up on top, right? There was good evidence to suggest it would work, but there wasn't a full blown meta analysis of a bunch of different trials of how do you get people to sign up to the NHS organ donor register after they've had to do a slightly annoying tax form, right? This is a specific context. And so you need to be mindful of this specific context. And so this was one of the first projects I ever did with the team. And I, I can tell you now, we had all the relevant people in the room. We had the behavioral scientists, we had the communications experts, we had the digital experts, we had the people who worked sort of in the frontline transplant industry. If we'd had to make a decision on the day, we would have picked that one. If we couldn't have tested it, that's the one we would have picked. And we would have done more harm than good. And so the reason I finish on this is because it's, it's really difficult to know what will work in a given situation. And you can have done, done all the background research, but unless you actually test it in the real world, it's really hard to know what will work. So the, the very last thing I'll end on, we implemented this, and we changed it. So that is 0.9 percentage points. So it's less than 1%. That might not sound very impressive. So this sample that we did with it was 1,085,000 people. And so upscaled over the course of a year, that change results in 96,000 additional registrations. So when you've got these points of contact with you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, you really need to be careful about the wording. You know, a couple of percentage points here and there can be, I mean, imagine how much it would take to convince that many people face to face. You can think of the value of these sorts of messages, these, these touch points that you have with people and how to get the most out of it. Um, so th thanks very much, thanks for listening.